Sorry. Okay. All righty. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are back. Um, this is Melissa. Le Le I can't even say my own name. That's great. Um, <laughs> this is Melissa Leilani Larson. This is why I, I ask people to call me Mel. It's much easier to say. Um, everyone, we're back for um, our second special awards session, um, honoring Michael Austin as our 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Um, and we're very glad to have um, Mr. John Benyon here to have a conversation with Michael about his work and contribution to Mormon Letters. Um, I'm going to be doing what I did in our previous conversation with Darlene and Angela, which is to um, keep an eye on the chat. If you've got questions or comments as we go through, please leave them in the live chat feature and I'll be sharing them with John and Michael as we go. So, um, so feel free to ask questions in the chat and, uh, and we'll get started. Thanks everybody. Uh, sneak into the back corner. I'm really pleased to uh, interview Michael Austin, uh, who I think is one of the essential critics of uh, Mormon literature, and uh, especially as he's honored today. I like the way uh, Christine Haugland in, Haugland in her award citation describes Michael's critical claims, quote, that our literature can both define us and challenge our sense of ourselves, that reading is morally and spiritually consequential and that words are part of the great welding link that connects us to the past and the future, to all of God's children and to all that is highest in us. That's the way I think of Michael's work. I think the best way to know Michael is to engage with his writing. And by the way, in this conversation, we're gonna use the word Mormon to refer to a culture region that has uh, geographical and other kinds of distinctnesses and includes people who have diverse relationships to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So let's go back 30 odd years. In the function of Mormon literary criticism at the present time, you advocate for a broad definition of Mormon literature as opposed to limiting to the term, quote, to those books written by Mormons for Mormons dealing with Mormon themes. What are some of the uh, main ways your definition of Mormon literature changed has changed in the past three decades. Um, I think that that essay that I wrote 30 years ago um, was very much an apprenticeship essay that I wrote. I was one year into a PhD program and uh, really thought I could sort of speak Mormon literature into existence by writing a really good article. And I think I probably um, overdefined, or I, I created too large a definition of Mormon literature in that essay, where I said that it's anything that can be read by a Mormon as having anything to do with Mormonism. Uh, that was a fairly grandiose uh, definition, but I think what I was doing was um, conflating what Connor Hilton talked about earlier today as a Mormon way of reading a text with Mormon literature or as literature that is somehow distinctively Mormon. So I think I probably narrowed my definition just a little bit. Um, and I, I apologize, I'm gonna make an adjustment here to try to make the light a little bit better, so. Okay. Okay, so Great. yeah, so I would be a little bit more focused in my definition today. Good deal. Um, that leads to us another question of, of the many critics uh, who have described the difficulty of fulfilling Orson Whitney's prediction that we will have Milton's and Shakespeare's of our own. Most describe it as a problem facing individual writers. And you mentioned this in that essay. Well, uh, mm -hmm. you talk about this. For example, Don D. Walker describes writers being either too inside or too outside the culture to write literary Mormon works. The first part of your article many years ago focuses on the, on the problematic history of seeing Mormon lit in terms of these binaries. How has that view limited us as writers and critics? Um, I think in nature, there really aren't binaries, there are spectrums. And, and I think that's true in Mormonness. I think that's true in what is and isn't literature. I think that's true in who qualifies as a Mormon. It certainly is a much broader term than uh, 
the, the member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I, I think that whenever we look at binaries, in almost every case, we're wrong. Uh, we need to look at things along a, a, a spectrum of, of a phenomenon. And so both Mormonness and literariness, um, when we, we say this is or isn't Mormon literature, I, I think we're, we're creating a binary rather than looking at the spectrum of what kind of Mormon, what kind of literature. Okay. And one, uh, in that article, you also point to the need, not just of, for individual genius, which is what those uh, writer, a lot of Mormon critics is foc have focused on, but you need to, uh, you uh, point to the need to have institutional for support for that individual genius. And in a later article, you list, quote, centers, symposia, endowed professorships, book series at university presses, presses, and the occasional fetch script in honor of its major practitioners. Why do you think that both individual genius in both writers and critics and institutional contexts are both important in building what you described yesterday as a tradition of scholarship? There is, within uh, the European Romantic tradition, there's this idea of the lone artistic genius who, with no support at all, kicks himself free from the world and creates great art and great literature. And, and that doesn't really happen. I mean, the few people who thought that way were extraordinarily privileged white guys who had a lot of money and didn't have to work and had great educations and really good libraries and a thousand years of tradition that they were building on. You know, if, if uh, Lord Byron had been born on a volcano in Peru or as a Chinese peasant, or even if he had just been born a woman, he would not have been Lord Byron. He would have been somebody that nobody remembered. So there is, there is these, these contexts and these institutions that prop up both literature and scholarship uh, that we often don't think about. And we, we think people are working outside of these institutions, but without institutional support, uh, literature just can't happen. You know, for Sophocles and Euripides to write their great plays, there had to be a theater complex in Athens. There had to be a Dionysian festival. There had to be audiences who could understand plays. There had to be stages that they could perform plays on. There had to be a mythic tradition that they could incorporate into what they were writing. So literature doesn't just come out of nowhere. And I think uh, one of the one of the primary responsibilities of the critic is to create an environment in which literature can be written and can be understood. And as I've gotten further and further into my career, I've realized that a lot of that has to do with creating institutions. Uh, it, it's the literary critics who uh, create the symposia, who create the fest scripts, who talk to each other about ideas and who talk back to people who aren't literary critics to kind of create and prepare the audiences for literature. And so I think that the critical work uh, is to support literature by creating both contexts and institutions in which it can occur. Yeah, that, I, I wish you'd talk to some uh, multimillionaires who think that economically they came out of nowhere, you know, so yeah. <laughs> the same, same idea applies. Nothing. If they'd have been born on a volcano in Peru, right. they wouldn't be multi-billionaires either. I mean, right. there's always a context and there are always institutions supporting things. Yeah, I think that's pretty universal. So uh, in a conversation we've had that uh, will be published in Literature and Belief, and by the way, this conversation is available kind of pre-publication on the Dawning of a Brighter Day website on the homepage. Um, what we talked a lot about institutions. And so what are some of the main institutions in the, uh, in, have supported the, have become infrastructure for Mormon literary studies? What are some of the main institutional infrastructure items? Well, one of them, and actually, can I, in anticipation of a question like that, uh, yeah. I'm gonna read something from an old book. Uh, this is Ray B. West's Writing in the Rocky Mountains, which, um, is, is really, it's uh, 1944. It's one of the first works of what I would call Mormon literary criticism. Um, and he's, he's writing right at the time that Vardis Fisher and Maureen Whipple and Virginia Sorensen 
are writing their Mormon novels. And he says, it is undoubtedly indicative that the first sizable group of genuine Rocky Mountain authors has sprung from the Mormon settlements of Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, and Arizona. And this is undoubtedly because the Mormons represented the single early group of permanent settlers to come into the region already possessed of a single unified belief, a cultural core against which the chaos of the frontier could be judged and set into some kind of order. So the first institution that supports Mormon literature and Mormon literary criticism is the, the church that has created a culture and an identity and a set of beliefs and a, a sort of a coherent core um, that provides some kind of order in what was at the time that West was writing still largely a part of the American frontier. Um, so, I mean, we will start there. And then the university that the church owns, the university system, um, Brigham Young University, the English department there that I know you were a part of for many years, the members of that department started the AML. Uh, they started dialogue. They, they began the teaching of Mormon literature and they created a lot of these original institutions for reasons which we got into a lot in our article. Uh, the BYU English department isn't performing that function anymore, uh, but the BYU library still is. Mm -hmm. uh, as we've talked about also today, the BYU library remains probably the largest collection of Mormon literature and papers of people who wrote Mormon literature in existence. It's a, tr it's a tremendous resource. Um, there is a, a, another set of institutions, I think, that have been created just in the last 10 or 15 years uh, as, as those those institutions that were created in the 70s have become old and uh, have been struggling for, for relevance. And I think these include uh, some of the micro presses that are publishing a lot of the Mormon literature now, um, Peculiar Pages, uh, uh, Zarahemla Books. I'm gonna be really self-promoting here and say BCC Press. Yeah. Um, also the Mormon literate or the Mormon studies departments that we're seeing at, at secular universities like the University of Virginia, like Claremont Graduate School, Utah State University, um, and the Mormon literature series at places like the University of Illinois, not Mormon literature, the Mormon studies series at uh, uh, University of Illinois Press, at Oxford University Press, and other university presses. These are enabling a kind of uh, scholarship about all kinds of Mormon issues, Mormon studies. Um, literature still has some catch up to play just compared to things like history and folklore and sociology and religious studies. But the, the large tide of Mormon studies in secular academic departments can benefit literature if, if we step up and put some of our literary scholarship out there. Uh, today, uh, Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez talked about the power of technology and specifically the web. Um, that's been uh, an institution or a non-institution, whatever, it gives access to everybody. How that, how, how's that helped uh, Mormon literature in the past couple decades? Well, it's uh, given us connections like the ones we have right now. I mean, yes. we can talk to each other, we can have this conference because everybody has the internet and can tune in and watch this. Uh, it's, also, it's also put an enormous amount of primary material into people's hands. I could not have done uh, any Mormon research of the kind that I do 20 years ago because the archives weren't online. Now you've got every book published before 1920 is usually available somewhere through uh, Google Books or the Hatha Trust. So that's a whole lot of literature. Um, universities have major archives online. You can, for example, go to Utah State and read the entire journals of Orson F. Whitney. Uh, you can go to the BYU sites and you can read uh, every periodical uh, that the church has put out since, since, 19, or since 1840. So that now is in the hands of everybody in the world. So I think those are the two things that the internet has done. It's put us in contact with each other. 
and it's given us primary sources, access to primary sources that used to require very expensive trips. Okay. Um, it, let's go back a while. In um, Kent Larson in the in the chat asked who was writing in 1944, and that let, made me think about uh, Vardis Fisher and your book on Vardis Fisher. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not. I don't know that I remember that quote from Mil William Mulder in the book, although it could have been there. But I do remember the sentiment. You know that um, that the the establishment of this pioneering group enabled uh, Mormon literature. Wh what did people like Vardis Fisher enable? Well, uh, Ray B. West is talking about Vardis Fisher. I'm sorry, Fisher Ray B. West. I got the yeah. mixed up. I'm you know, sorry. He's talking about Vardis Fisher. I mean, he has a chapter in here about Vardis Fisher, George Dixon Snell, and Maureen Whipple, and, and a few other of these writers. So Vardis Fisher is really at the top of, of who West is talking about. They created... Um, uh, they created a kind of regional literature. See, this is a thing that that was true from about 1840 or 1850 to about 1950. Uh, Mormonism and a certain region of America were almost completely identical. Most of Mormonism was confined to a particular region of Utah, parts of Idaho, Arizona, um, a little bit of California, a little bit of Arizona. And though that region, demographers um, began in the, in the 40s calling this the Mormon culture region, uh, be, not because everybody in it was Mormon, because everybody in it most certainly wasn't Mormon, but because everybody in it was defined by their relationship to Mormonism. So if you're living in Utah in 1950 and you're not Mormon, not being Mormon is part of your identity in a way that not being Mormon in New York is never part of your identity, right? So there's this culture region, which is an American cultural region at a time when regional literature is becoming important. So you have Mormonism is both a religion and a specific geographical area. Now that is no longer true. And in the future, that will not be true of Mormon literature. That's a historical, a contingent historical fact that for about a hundred years, you could take Mormonism and you could make it a geographical thing. And that geographical thing could play into a, a tapestry of other geographical culture regions, Southern literature, Mississippi Delta literature, Great Plains literature, um, Pacific Northwest literature. Mormon literature could be geographic at that time. And so today, Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez talked about you know, the establishment of institutions and of his work along those lines mm -hmm. in South American literature. And um, I, I don't know, you mentioned different areas of the United States, but the same is true of uh, cultures across the world that are, are Mormon and um, also residents of some country. What, what are the difficulties of, for someone like Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez, bridging two traditions? Well, I think that over the next 50 or 60 years, almost everything important in Mormon literature is gonna happen outside of the United States and definitely outside of the Mormon cultural region. Um, that is the area that's growing. That's the area whose stories haven't been told yet. That's where a lot of the interesting things are gonna happen. Um, they, those regions still don't have the necessary institutions to, pro to produce, I mean, they have the institutions to produce a novel or a poem. But they, there, there needs to be some institution building in other languages and other countries, archives, presses, journals. Some of our journals need to be doing, uh, we need to be doing literature in languages other than English, uh, because because in order for Mormon literature, Mormon culture in general to emerge in uh, in a lot of these places where where English is not spoken, there's going to have to be institutional support built or lent from the institutions we have here. In the chat, William Morris talked about, um, he said in the text, you know, in our conversation that uh, is on the AML website, you, the, we pointed out that the there are structural issues that make it difficult for Mormon literary criticism to flourish. And to go a little further with the background to that question is, uh, 
in your essay, The Perpetual Brief History and Perpetual Exciting Future of Mormon Literary Studies, you talk about uh, the idea that Mormon literary studies have, has had a difficult time breaking free from, and this is your quote, what you say, the largely internal audience for Mormon intellectual discourse. So it's regional to the nth degree and parochial. In our conversation, you talk about the difficulty of writing criticism of Mormon literature. You say, quote, scholarship requires a level of detachment that is very difficult to maintain when the subject of that scholarship is also a belief system that structures people's lives. Also, you say the same is true of Mormon literature itself, quote, most of the writers worth studying are going to be on the margins of Mormon culture, either just barely on the inside or all the way out. Uh, and then uh, you finally say, anyone who has to build Mormon literary scholarship to succeed has to figure out not only how to br build bridges to non-Mormon scholars, but how to, to build bridges from the margins of Mormonism back to the sender. And so you've talked about three areas and they're, it's, it's a continuum. So there are as many areas as there are people, but how do you envision this relationship between writers and critics in the center, those on the margins and those outside the circle with William Morris's, you know, it, it, it's difficult for Mormon literary criticism to flourish because of this structure. So the, the literary critic generally, I think, uh, needs to talk to two different groups of people, sometimes at the same time, sometime in very different works. Um, we are always talking to other literary critics so as a, a Mormon literary critic, I, I need to be producing things that people who know very little about Mormonism can read and maybe understand why there's a literary tradition here that matters, why it's distinct from other kinds of literature. So there's a kind of uh, disciplinary conversation that needs to happen. But then there has to be a conversation back to people who aren't professors. Uh, and this is where most literary critics not just Mormon literary critics, this is where most literary critics generally fail uh, because there are a lot fewer tenurable rewards for writing articles in magazines or blogs or newspapers to create audiences for Mormon literature or any kind of literature than to write really dense and obscure things for one's colleagues that get published by university presses and prestigious journals. Both of these are necessary. Uh, but one of them is just much more highly rewarded than the other one. So we, we, we need, I think, we need a lot more work by Mormon literary scholars to, to write in places that ordinary non-professor types are going to read about why certain kinds of literature in, are important and, and what, what you can learn from it. Um, but yeah, I think that it's difficult in that first kind of writing I'm talking about, that writing for your peers. Um, it's very difficult to write about sacred things in a way that doesn't either make you look like some kind of religious nut or doesn't make you look like, um, like a, a heretic to your own people. Well, my goal is to do both of those at once. You, know? you want to look like a nut and a heretic. Right. Yeah, that's no, good. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, okay, um, thank you. Um, uh, William Morris asks further, are there similar issues related to theoretical structures? He goes on, um, that is, it seems to take, like a lot of the talk about Mormon literature is about the potential for it or what it should or shouldn't be rather than what it has been and is or how it can be viewed. To be blunt, is there enough is there not enough or is there too much theory in Mormon literature? So those are two really good and really hard questions. Um, I think as you and I discussed in our conversation uh, for literature and belief, I think that there's been way too much manifestoing going on in Mormon literature <laughs> where people like me and I did one of well, the, the article that, that we started with was my 1994 manifesto that says, hey, I'm a bright young intellectual, I know lots of stuff, and there's Mormon literature, and we should pay attention to it because it exists. And, you know, there's probably 30 of those that I could pull out of my files, where somebody over the last hundred years has said, literature is really important, Mormon literature should exist, and here are some 
ways that we can talk about it. I think we have done enough of that kind of theorizing. I think that declaring that Mormon literature exists or that it should exist or that Mormons should read literature, that level of theory, um, every literary movement does that once. Usually people move on and then they start building canons and then building institutions. So yeah, I think that that, that sort of basic manifesto theorizing um, doesn't need to happen anymore. I, I think we're ready to move on to the next stage. And really the next stage is what the AML it just did, the canon building, the creating a recognized body of literature that we can look at and study and say, when we study Mormon literature, this is what we mean. And here are some books. Um, but you can't just identify it. Then you need to start writing about it, talking about it, talking to your disciplinary peers about it, but also talking back to the center of the culture and saying, hey, here's, uh, here's why you should read this novel. Here's why you should read uh, this, this poem by Orson F. Whitney, this strange epic poem that was written in 1904. And, um, and you know, it, there's, there's reasons for this and it, it can help you learn things and, and here's what you, you can learn. So I think that there's a whole lot of that work, both the disciplinary work and the cultural work within Mormon culture um, to, to do before most people have any understanding of what Mormon literature is. Earlier, uh, Darlene referred to uh... Uh, times of trouble in the 90s in the English department. And one of the main uh, troubles was between the new critics, people who just focused on the text entirely, and people who were more interested, who were interested in the text and close reading of the text, but also in other things like history and sociology and what psychology and whatever. And your view of the critic is interesting to me. In this, the, art, the second article, the the perpetual future, perpetual future, you descry, decry the idea of prescriptive criticism that might say, for example, that Mormons should write faithful fiction, but you say that critics and theorists use, quote, literature as a starting point for commenting on, critiquing, and helping to construct the cultures that produce and consume books. This gives critics a lot of a broad cultural role and responsibility why, why is that perspective so important? Well, that's a kind of an idealized version of what I think the critic should be. <laughs> Ultimately, somebody has to read what we write. Yeah. Um, most literary critics in the United States right now um, write to almost nobody. Uh, you know, journal articles and books have vanishingly small readerships when they deal with lots of literary subjects. So... I think that it, it's really important if, if scholars and critics are going to be influential, they have to write where people can read what we write. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I spend a lot of time blogging on By Common Consent, um, because that's a place where, where people will read mm -hmm. um, things that I have to say that they won't read if I publish in PMLA. I'll, yeah. That will look really nice on my Vita, but nobody will read what I write. So I think that, um, that there's really a huge need in our culture for scholars and, and historians have done this and uh, Book of Mormon scholars have done this. I mean, in, in a lot of these areas, um, we've had the scholars write for, for ordinary people. This was huge in the 1960s. Uh, you probably remember the Out of the Best Books series. Yeah. I think that was Martin Clark. And who else did that? I don't, I don't remember. I mean, this, these were priesthood lessons. These were church lessons and curriculum that were, that were revolved around reading great books, great literature, and then having this guy to kind of tell you how to read it or teach you what it means. Um, you go all the way back to the 1900s. Every year, the Mutual Improvement Association put out a list of books that they would be reading that year, and it included a lot of great novels. Um, so you, you, had, you have had times in the church's history where literature was part of the standard curriculum. Um, we don't have that anymore. 
so we, we don't have a, a place where the, the critics and the scholars um, kind, of, kind of lead people through talking about great literature, not great literature, Mormon literature, any kind of literature. And uh, I think that um, that's our first responsibility as scholars and critics is, is to get read and to get read by, by actual people. Uh, Darlene was talking earlier about the, what, she, what seems to be in some ways a golden age when BYU professors were starting the AML in the 70s and, uh, and later, much later. Um, and, but there was a time in the AML um, when we started inviting non academics into the AML board. Lima Brummett, a bookseller, a, a journalist whose name I've, has gone out of my head. And, and so we were trying to uh, make room for what you're talking about more of this non academic communication between people about uh, liter literature. So, um, Academics talking to themselves are almost never going to have much of an impact on anything. Right. Okay. That's, uh, that's uh, so true. <laughs> here's, here's another, um, you connect Mormon literature as a cut subcategory of American literature. That's one of your themes throughout mm -hmm. a lot of what you've written and, and uh, I'll, uh, in a, uh, not in opposition, but some critics think of Mormon literature more as a, an, an anomaly. I can't even say the word, you know, uh, something, a unique category that doesn't belong in any other category. But from you think it, uh, Mormon literature, Mormon literary studies is a subcategory of American literature. Why? Well, I think historically that has been the case. I, I do think, well, as I said, about the, we're the, moving into more of a world right, literature. Right. But right. I think that for the last 150 years, Mormon literature has been an identifying, identifiable subcategory of American literature. Um, there are a lot of these subcategories. You know, there, pretty much everybody has a literature of their own these days. And yeah. some of them are religious. There's Jewish literature. There's Catholic literature. Uh, there, there's American Muslim literature, and some of it is really, really good right now. There's some really exciting things happening there. Um, there's regional literature. There's Southern literature, Northern literature, New England literature, um, Great Plains literature. And Mormonism, for most of its history, has been very solidly identified with a region. Um, and so when you look at things that are like Mormon literature, there are all kinds of things that are in a lot of ways like Mormon literature. Now, nothing is exactly like Mormon literature, just like nothing is exactly like Louisiana Bayou literature. Every literature is, is um, unique in some ways, but there's nothing terribly unique about a, a subculture with a dominant religion um, producing a body of literature that is also a part of American literature. There are dozens of examples of such things in the world and in, in American literature. And each, and, uh, each but they're, 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 this has been done before, so there's some similarity, but, but each of them has to have a unique quality yeah. or they wouldn't. And so uh, in the uh, 2015 article, you said the, the story and theology of Mormonism form a unique, compelling, and largely misrepresented or underrepresented, I, I, you might say, part of the larger narrative of the American spirit experience. What is unique and compelling about Mormon literature? And why did you say misrepresented rather than unrepresented, underrepresented? Oh, Mormon literature has not, Mormonism has not been underrepresented in American literature. Okay. okay. If you look especially at the right. 19th century, it is overrepresented. Um, if you look at 1960, I'm sorry, 1860 through about 1890, you've got dozens of dime novels featuring Mormon characters doing all kinds of wacky things, uh, stealing women and uh, regularly destroying wagon trains, and you've got avenging Danites. I mean, Mormonism in the second half of the 19th century is dramatically overrepresented, but it's under understood. I mean, yeah, it's a sensationalized picture of Mormonism. I mean, this is when you get 
um, study in Scarlet. This is where you get Riders of the Purple Sage, uh, Dane Coolidge's The Fighting Danites. I mean, you get a whole lot of very popular literature uh, with Mormons in them, but th they're not well understood. They're a category. And um, so the polygamy... second part of that is what, what's unique about if, if Mormon, Mormonism is represented properly or accurately in some way, what is unique and compelling about it? Well, we're the largest homegrown American religion. Uh, we have a, a fantastically complex history. Uh, it includes a period of, of polygamy and transgressive sexuality, a period of, of uh, really communalism, transgressive economics. We have the conversion into wildly monogamous uh, capitalist Republicans. Um, we have, uh, we have a very close community, which has a wonderful side. And it also has, you know, every time you draw a circle, you create insiders and outsiders. And we've done that in some phenomenal ways. We have interesting uh, theology, but a lot of Latter-day Saints don't understand where the most interesting parts of their theology are. Uh, I mean, I think that um, if you ask most people, most Mormons, most Latter-day Saints, what's something unique that Mormons believe, um, families are forever, which actually pretty much everyone believes. I mean, pretty much everyone believes they will be with their family after they die. Um, but I mean, the idea of exaltation, uh, the idea of there not really being original sin, because uh, under in the Mormon doctrine, uh, Adam and Eve made the correct choice. That's really, there are huge implications to that that have yet to be worked out, I think, in literature. Um, so, so yeah, I think that there's a lot, there are a lot of wonderful, wild, great, complicated, nuanced stories in Mormon history and Mormon doctrine. And that's, that's kind of stuff that, that literature is made of. This is what makes great literature. It's mm. also what makes mediocre literature. And you, know, <laughs> you need a lot of mediocre to get to excellence because excellence is really just a statistical function. Just to underscore your point, William Morris in the chat says, if, you, if I think back to my Western regionalism class, which didn't include any work by Mormon authors, it seems to me that Mormon fiction could have something to say about frontier, manifest destiny, etc. And then Mel Larson said, pointed out the interesting idea of having the works you mentioned, those sensationalist works, colliding with more uh, serious things. I don't know that there's a question there. It's just interesting. Mike, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I have a, it strikes me that in some ways, um, Gideon Burton talks about Relief Society magazine going clear back. And before that, the, um, there was the Women's Exponent, and, which was where a lot of the um, conflict with sensational pictures of Mormonism was kind of worked out or processed by women in the church. And I know you're more attracted to that old literature than modern literature, but, and maybe some of it is because they were really dealing with those issues, that, those core issues you're talking about. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Yeah. Uh, I will say that, yes, to, to Gideon's point, I think probably, one of the first introductions that I had to great literature uh, was when my mother, um, who I think is out there somewhere, hi mom, um, <laughs> <laughs> was teaching a, um, a Relief Society lesson that was based on Sterling Sills' book, The Majesty of Books. And I read that. And it, it wasn't about Mormon literature, but it was about the value of literature in a spiritual context. And, and that is that's just been something that came from a Relief Society. And this was only in the 1980s. I mean, this is, um, I mean, it's not recent, but it was, it, was, um, it was part of the curriculum in my lifetime. Now, as far as working out the, the negative images of Mormonism, it, it's interesting that there were several books by non-Mormon writers in the 1930s that became part of the, the uh, priesthood relief society or primary curriculum. Uh, and probably the most important of these is a book by Susan Ertz called The Proselyte, which has a dramatic story of Mormons crossing the plains and making sacrifices. And she's a, she's a British and American writer. 
Um, she's well known. This is a very sympathetic book, uh, but it, it did, that literature became part of our curriculum. It was in the primary manual, read to the children from Susan Ertz's book, The Proselyte, and it gives you the page numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, another book, Hell and Hallelujah, um, which I don't even remember the guy who wrote it. It, it was a, a 1930, very complimentary book that was quoted in conference and advertised in the inside. So when these books uh, by non-Mormons that were pos- that portrayed the Mormon experience positively, um, the church and the curriculum writers of the church just pounced on them because they were so excited to see uh, not non-Latter-day Saints taking more Mormonism seriously and presenting a very positive view of it. You, you uh, have said several times about your dim view of yourself 30 years ago, but I'm more impressed with you 30 years ago than you are. Uh, I liked, maybe I'm mixing up, but you had all kinds of categories in that article uh, that constituted Mormon literature, uh, books by Mormons, for Mormons, or was that in the 2015 article? I'm no, that was in the 1994 yeah. article. Books by Mormons, for Mormons, books by non-Mormons, for Mormons, books by uh, Mormons, for non-Mormons, and so on. You know, all these categories. Yeah. In the chat, Rosalind Eves talks about, I'm curious where you draw the line around Mormon literature, books by, and she lists two categories, books by Mormon authors, however identified, and books by that only feature Mormon characters such as her work. There's no Mormon character in that, in her uh, fantasy series and her other books, but, or I don't know about the other one, but, but there definitely is in Beyond the Map Stars. Okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't read Mormon that character in there. I'm embarrassed to say I haven't read that, but uh, anyway. Well, you ought to, it's a really good book. I, I, I love her <laughs> writing, so I will. I will. Yeah. And then she goes on to say, I guess, get the sense that Michael wouldn't qualify most of those dime novels or sensationalist Mormon, uh, as Mormon literature since they're working mostly from stereotypes. What, what something like Wallace Stegner qualify or even more interest, you know, uh, Louise Plummer, Rosalind Eves, you know, people who, who are writing well for the natural audience who have Mormonism in their bloodstream. So remember what we said at the beginning that uh, in nature there really aren't dichotomies. There's a, there are spectrums. Yes. Uh, whether or not dime novels or Mormon literature, there's a spectrum. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that they are literature about Mormons and they're part of the story. Uh, so I think that understanding how Mormonism was portrayed in the second half of the 20th century. You've got to deal with the anti-polygamy novels of the 1950s or 1850s. These are the um, twin pillars of barbarism novels. You've got to deal with the dime novels and you've got to deal with the sort of mocking humor of Mark Twain and um, uh, a number of other people who wrote sort of funny things about Mormons and their many wives. Those, that, those are the images that that construct how um, how the world saw Latter-day Saints in the second half of the 19th century. So I think Mormon literary critics have to be familiar with those and have to understand those and have to talk about them. Whether or not they constitute Mormon literature is just a definitional question that depends on where you set the bars. But they're important to the understanding of the experience of Mormonism uh, historically, and the, underst- the way that Mormonism was understood, and the sorts of things that Mormon writers responded to. Mm-hmm. I-, I mentioned that a lot of the issues you described when you're talking about the uniqueness of Mormonism and the literature it could produce w- was set back then. Gideon Burton, you know, back in the 19th century, Gideon Burton asks, do you see a different role for Molit or Molit Crit? <laughs> within the current culture, especially with today's stronger social sensitivities or concern over those marginalized or in light of people leaving? Um, well, uh, that's, that's a hard question. I, I think that there's a role for a, a more traditional kind of historical criticism. I think there's a role for a more modern kind of criticism. I mean, I think that um, all of these are legitimate things to do. Uh, I think that a lot of these questions of marginalization, uh, questions of people leaving the church and, and what, what, to do, what that does to a close-knit community, 
those are things that have been worked out for a hundred years. Uh, last night, I talked a little bit about a, a novel from 1936 called Poplars Across the Moon, which was about a faith transition in a very close Mormon community. Uh, you look at the work of Josephine Spencer, it's all over that. Uh, and that's written from the 1890s. So looking at the historical stuff can help us. And one of the great things about, about writing literary criticism is your, your literature, they can be good examples or bad examples. I mean, literature works just as well as a bad example. So I can say, here's, here's, where, here's where Mormons wrote a novel and they really screwed stuff up. Let's talk about why. Mm -hmm. um, I, think it, I think it is important that we give ourselves a tradition to write about mm -hmm. because you just can't have a scholarly community without a literary tradition. That tradition starts back in 1930 with the publication of the Book of Mormon, and it goes up to the, the modern day to the, uh, the excellent John Benyon novel, Spin, that BCC Press published this year. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that plug. You know. <laughs> um, and all of this is important. All of this is part of a tradition. And, and writers are gonna write what they're gonna write. As a critic, yeah. I don't have any opinion on what writers write. I take what they do, uh, and I try to make some sense out of it, and I try to organize it into some kind of structure that says something about, um, well, about the world, about the church, about society, about morality, about theology. But uh, I, I like to group works of literature into a body and then try to interpret that body. You just mentioned uh, a book that we don't often think of as Mormon literature, or many of us don't. And in, um, in the brief history and perpetually exciting future, you advocate for studies that read the Book of Mormon as a literary text. And then following your own advice, since the, then you've published uh, Buried Treasures, reading the Book of Mormon again for the first time, and a review of a, a really great anthology, Americanist Approaches to the Book of Mormon, published by University of Oxford Press. And you have another book coming out on, on the Bible and the Book of Mormon, A Testimony of Two Nations, how the Book of Mormon reads and rereads the Bible. Why are our studies of the Book of Mormon, literary and cultural studies, as important as devotional, theological, historical, or other kinds of studies? Why literary studies? So the Book of Mormon, among other things, has a lot of stories in it. And so uh, literary theory or narrative theory is a good way to study stories. The Bible also has a lot of stories in it. You know, if, if you read other sacred works, say the Quran, not a lot of stories. Um, so literary criticism works really well on both the Bible and the Book of Mormon because the narrative component uh, means that understanding sort of the literary basis of it um, is important to understanding what it means. The, the writers of the Bible thought they were writing literature. Uh, the writers of the Book of Mormon at least thought they were writing stories. So understanding how stories work is important. Now, the two books you talk about um, are very different books. Buried Treasures was a collection of blog posts that I wrote in, 19, no, in 2016, mm -hmm. when I read the Book of Mormon after a long period of not reading it. Um, and was just astounded at some of the things that I found. That was written to the world. That was written to members of the church. That was, it was written, it's a, it's a book that I hope found a popular audience. And by popular, I don't mean that a lot of people read it, just that people read it. Well, we um, read it in my uh, book club. Ah, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the book that is now in the uh, peer review process, the uh, Testimony of Two Nations, How the Book of Mormon Reads and Rereads the Bible, that is an academic book. That is a book that is mainly written to other um, literature scholars and religion scholars who are familiar with the Bible, who have no idea how the Book of Mormon fits into that, to try to, to position the Book of Mormon narratively within a biblical canon and, and to do that in ways that will be acceptable to people who, who study these things academically. So that's, not a, that's a book that is meant where I want to talk to my peers about something. Mm -hmm. um, the Buried Treasures is where I want to talk to a general audience about something. And those, again, those are the two things that, that I think literary criticism should do. Um, 
and I, I admire you for trying for doing both of those. That's that's a, a great uh, thing. You were going to say something else. I'm sorry. Well, no, I was just going to go kind of go back to the original question: Why I read the Book of Mormon as literature? Because it makes you can find some interesting things there. There are interesting points, some of which have devotional consequences or implications, and some of which don't. They're just mm -hmm. interesting and fun. If you read, you know, you you assume that the person writing this is telling a story. When people are telling stories, there are certain cognitive mechanisms that are activated that are that are common across across the world. And um, getting at some of those in the Book of Mormon produces interesting readings. And I think more than anything else, I want to be interesting. Good, good deal. You mentioned BCC Press, and we've talked about it a little bit. Su Hao in the chat says, as for today, what are the criteria for accepting work for BCC Press? What do you see as the mission of BCC Press in the entire field of Mormon literary studies? So this is, um, BCC Press has just been a fascinating project for the last five years. Uh, this is something that we talked about for years on the BCC backlist before we before we started the press. And we originally figured we were going to lose about $1,000 a book. We would publish between two and three books a year. And, um, and we would support ourselves through donations. And we even started a donation campaign uh, so people could support this press that was going to lose money and not publish very much. And then our, after we published our first book, um, things happened that just astounded me. Uh, one thing is really major writers came forward and said, hey, I'm interested in public. Mehdi Harrison, who is, was one of my favorite writers. I mean, I love her uh, Bishop's Wife series. It's one of my favorite mystery series and one of my favorite sets of Mormon books ever. And she just emails me and says, oh, I've got this book called The Book of Laman. Um, would you be interested in looking at it? And I'm like, Harrison just wrote. And then, um, I, uh, I sent a little text to Melissa uh, Leilani Larson here, she who is conducting this session and said, hey, we're starting a press, got anything? And she said, oh yeah, I would love to publish uh, these two plays that I wrote as, as a book. Um, Rachel Hunt Steenblick, who had this book called Mother's Milk. So all of a sudden we get major people um, who I have read and admired for a long time say, we would like to publish with you. And then, then their books sold and they sold like tens of thousands of copies, some of them. And so we realized we had a niche that we had no idea existed. And, and we didn't have any idea how we were going to produce manuscripts because there were just about five of us and we didn't know how to typeset and we didn't know how to do cover design. We didn't have enough time to do all the proofreading. Well, then volunteers come forward. Uh, Lori Forsyth, uh, who's an excellent proofreader, says, hey, I'd like to volunteer. Um, Christian Harrison, who designs all of our covers, just kind of, uh, he was on the BCC backlist at the time and said, hey, I could do some covers. And Andrew Heiss, who did all the typesetting for the Maxwell Institute, contacted us, volunteered. Um, Connor Hilton and, and CC Prophet, who do a lot of our publicity work, volunteered. So people kind of got a sense of the vision of BCC Press and came forward and volunteered. So we've published 11 books this year and have about nine more to go. We should hit 20 books this year. All of them are profitable. Uh, and we've realized we've got a niche. And so to answer Susan's question, uh, and Susan does have a book of poetry that will be published next year by BCC yeah. Press. Um, it, we developed our mission. We had to, re we had to retrofit our mission. <laughs> Because originally our mission was to lose money and publish the kinds of books that couldn't get published otherwise. Um, now we realize there's a lot more of an appetite for the, these kinds of books. What we want are books that we think say interesting or important things about Mormonism through poetry, through fiction, through drama, through memoir, any, through anything. But, and, and we wanna focus on books that do not have other natural publishers. You know, it's it, uh, most of our books, it, it would be hard to imagine who would have published them if we hadn't published them. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of book that we want. We want to fill a space. Uh, we want to fill a space that uh, is 
honest about Mormonism. It doesn't have, uh, you know, orthodoxy requirements, but that is is supportive of of the church and of the religious community. Uh, but that that says interesting and unique things, uh, and that that really that is the sort of thing that does not have a natural publisher in the Mormon ecosystem. And it turns out there's a lot of manuscripts that meet that description. Good deal, good deal. I'm gonna shift gears uh, and you've published a lot with artist partial. How do you say his artist name? Artist partial. Partial. Her uh, name. Her, I'm so yes. sorry. I've, I've mucked it up. What, what do you have to say about her and the role of archivists as a support of literary studies. Kent Larson talked about collecting and preserving and gathering today. So artist, artist partial is absolutely the best archival researcher I've ever met. Uh, she works, she knows the church history uh, library probably better than anybody else. And she is very, very generous about sending things to people who she knows to be working on things. So she originally sent me a cache of letters. Uh, and this is before I met her. She just knew that I was working on sort of lost generation writers. And she sent me a cache of letters between John Widso and Paul Bailey, a Mormon oh. novelist, um, which ended up becoming a, an article in the Journal for Mormon History about those letters. Um, she has found things, let me give you an example. Um, this is the, the first of the things that we published. It is uh, just a copy of The Trials of Mary Maverick, which is um, an 1850 novel written by, uh, 1853, I'm sorry, by John Russell, who was a neighbor of the Mormons in Illinois. He, uh, he had Mormons staying with him. He had generally positive experiences with the saints, uh, wrote a letter, which we found defending the Mormons in, in the, the Carthage newspaper. This is the first novel about Mormonism by an American. It is the first work of fiction by a non-Mormon American about Mormons. There was one copy of this in the entire world. It was in the church history library and artists found it and transcribed it. <laughs> Had it not been for artists, this would not exist. And the next generation would have no idea that it ever existed. That's the kind of thing that people like artists have done and, and continue to do. Um, they track down and find things that are hidden in archives. Uh, I'll give another example. Uh, this is a book. So Vardis Fisher is Boise. This is a book about Boise that Vardis Fisher wrote in the 1830s when he was the uh, director of the Idaho Writers Project, which was part of the Federal Writers Project. It was a depression era um, thing. Uh, nobody ever knew this book existed until about three years ago when an archivist at Boise State named um, Alessandro Mergaglia um, found this in the U.S. government's archives. There's this book by Vardis Fisher, a fairly major Mormon writer, I think, uh, that nobody had ever heard of until he found this and transcribed it and published it. Uh, we heard Kent today talking about thousands of poems and stories that are in the archives that nobody knows about. Nobody's read in, in 150 years. Um, it is the archivists and the people who are searching the archives who are going to restore to our tradition things that, that we don't even know about yet. A whole lot of our literary history is unknown to us because nobody has done the necessary archival work to bring it out. That was a proper tribute. Thank you <laughs> to the archivists of the world. Uh, you've been pretty diverse in your writing about Mormon literature from Tempe, T Terry Tempest Williams to Brian Evanson, Medi Harrison to Stephanie Meyer, the Book of Mormon to Angels in America, Josephine Spencer to Big, Big Love. Um, I don't ha really have a precise question, but you have any comments? It, it, you, th this breadth certainly underscores your mission to broaden the Mormon literary canon. Um. I, it all relates in my mind. It all is part of the same <laughs> set of arguments in my mind. It doesn't relate to anybody else, but that's because nobody has my crazy mind. 
Um, but it's all part of a certain tradition about how how America sees Mormons and how Mormons re react to the way that they are seen. And, you know, that to me, it's all very consistent and all might as well just have been about the same, the same writer. It's just because it's the same question in, in a hundred different forms. And, I, and there's a whole lot more to do with that question. Which I'll ask you about in just a minute, but uh, I'm in, in, impressed with anyone who does their time. And I, I'm speaking that accurately in administration. It's like serving time. Um, and you've done that for 22 years, but at the same time, you've published nine books, six editions, 36 articles and book chapters, and about 30 reviews, at least those numbers, divided between Mormon and non-Mormon audiences. And how, how did you do that? <laughs> um, it's interesting. I never, I did not write this much when I was a professor. I, I didn't write that much at all. I really started writing in earnest when I became an administrator 22 years ago. And there are, there are two reasons for that. Um, one is being an administrator is at least predictable. I work from eight to five and then I go home and I can do other things. Whereas when I was a faculty member, a teaching professor, I always had another set of papers to grade. I always had another lecture to prepare. I, I, I never really felt like I was done. Um, and then the other thing is spending this much time in administration, I had to write in order to maintain my sense of self-respect. You know, I had, I, I had to feel myself like I was living an intellectual life and I was certainly not doing that. Uh, you know, you didn't even mention how many assessment reports I've written oh. or how many accreditation self-studies I've written. Oh. But, you know, I don't put those on my Vita because that's not, that's not intellectual work, that, that's really bureaucratic work. So when I became a, a useless overpaid bureaucrat, I would come home and write, uh, and I write about three to four hours a day. And um, that's, I've just been doing that for the last 25 years. And I don't watch television and I don't have a life. I don't go places. I don't have, you know, I don't have many friends. I don't I have many interests. I don't like sports. I write a lot. Well, it's certainly our good fortune that that happens. And I don't think of administrative work as useless because it administrators sacrifice so that faculty can teach. And that's such important work. Uh, what are you working on now? Well, my big project is the, uh, the Book of Mormon and the Bible book, The yeah. Testimony of Two Nations. Uh, I am expecting the peer reviews back uh, by August 1st, after which I will, um, you know, guided by the peer reviews, I will either make a few surface level changes and submit it, or I'll fundamentally redo everything that I was thinking about and spend the next year changing everything. And this all depends on what the peer reviewers say. So that's a big project. Um, I have been working for about five years very slowly on a critical edition of Orson F. Whitney's poem, Elias, uh, an epic poem that he wrote in 1904. Um, and that should be coming out hopefully next year. Uh, and then I am working for the curriculum, for the Sunday school curriculum of next year. I'm working on a book I've been threatening to write for a while. Um, on the parables, basically, but Jesus's parables as narratives and how we structure those into some sort of coherent understanding of the kingdom of God. Um, well, that's I look about forward it. to those. I look forward to seeing those. Um, and so that, uh, I'd like to kind of give you a chance to, to summarize, what, what's your outlook for the future of Mormon literary studies? I think that we have a lot of excellent literature being written right now in the Mormon community. I think that this is a very good time for, um, for literature, for creative people. We have a lot of creative people. Um, I think that we are still in an institution building stage in, in Mormon literary studies. 
Uh, and I think that, uh, that we have some huge, tremendous opportunities. The University of Illinois Press with their new Mormon lives or their, their uh, Foundations of Mormon Thought series have created a, a huge opening for people to, to write about Mormon literature if they're willing to do it. Um, we're starting to see major, pre major presses like Oxford University Press publishing about the Book of Mormon as literature. Uh, I think that space in the profession is opening up. Um, a lot will depend on who decides to step into that space. And I, I don't know. I hope people do. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anything um, that you wanted to say that I didn't ask about? I don't think so. Okay. I think you asked everything. Thank you very much. John. Well, thank I, you. I, was a, I had a great time. It's been a pleasure for me as well, uh, Mel. Oh, I've just been enjoying the conversation. Um, I think it's, uh, we've, been, we've been talking a lot today about, you know, um, about how the, we as artists, there's so many of us here at AML, I am one of the creative writers um, who, you know, need people to both see and read and be aware of our work and to talk about it. Um, the criticism is a necessary part of what we do. And, um, and I'm just so grateful, Michael, for what you have done and brought to the field. I'm also really uh, grateful for the fact that I was brave enough to write you a little email and that you were kind enough to respond to it, um, that BCC Press exists and for the work that it's doing. Um, it's tremendously important to where we are. And I know to my own work personally, from a selfish perspective. So um, this has been a great conversation uh, to be a part of and, and um, to be a fly on the wall, really. Uh, thank you, John, for your time and for, um, and for being here with us. And thank you, Michael, for letting us have this little you know, moment you. to shine that spotlight on you um, directly in your eyes. Um, I realize uh, I have one more thing to say, oh, sure. which, which I, I hope I... I, I said it in uh, a review that is coming out in dialogue of the Vardish F Fisher book, but is what is pleasant about your criticism is that it's so well written. It's very well crafted, easy to understand. And so oh, that's a, a blessing. And I uh, certainly uh, was excited to find out that the Lifetime Achievement Award was being given to you this year. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll admit that when I first heard that, my first thought was Herodotus, the conversation between Salon and Crassus, where he says, call no man happy until he's dead. Well, and, for, for a <laughs> so while, I, and every person who got this award in the AML, as soon as they got it, that year they died. So, yeah. So I am, well, I'm hoping that I, I don't live long enough to screw this up and make you regret the choice. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a great note to end on. So thanks All very right. much, John. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, please come back to uh, the AML YouTube channel tonight at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, where we're going to um, have a fabulous presentation of our annual award winner.